I believe that God gives everybody a little corner of Eden to tend, not just a metaphysical, spiritual corner, that's for sure. But I think he gives us a physical place that is ours, um, that's where we're supposed to tend and steward and maintain, and just in the way that he's called us to. And so, yeah, that's our little corner of Eden. And it mightn't be everybody's idea of a corner of Eden, but it is certainly ours. Welcome to The Home and the Maker, sharing advice and encouragement about all topics homemaking and homesteading and honoring the maker in all of it. Join Megan from Shine.fm for today's conversation. So welcome to episode five of the Home and the Maker podcast. And I think we all kind of desire life to be simpler, life to be more peaceful, um, to be able to breathe a little bit. And I'm excited to have Darren from We Are Messengers, a band that we play on Shine.fm on the podcast day to talk about the simple life that he and his family are pursuing and a little basically summary, I think, if I if I get this correct, is that you're from Ireland, raised the family in Ireland for a time, moved the family to Nashville to pursue music and because that's where the music industry is. And then within the past year or two, move the family back to Ireland for um, just more peace, a uh, simpler life. So thanks mm-hmm. for joining me on the podcast because I have all the questions. <laughs> No, that's okay. And you can ask anything you want. Um, yeah, no, that's a good summary. Um, I would say that I probably wouldn't have said that I moved to Nashville to pursue music. I was not interested in in a rec- recording deal or a record contract. I loved Ireland. I loved my home. I loved the life we had in our church with our community. I didn't need I didn't need music. Um, but God opened that door, and perfectly we went through it. And I suppose we found ourselves living. In the mid Tennessee area, Franklin, Spring Hill, um, you know, we bought a home. Uh, tried to make community, tried to make it feel like home, but it just wasn't. You know, uh, my wife did a wonderful job at doing everything you could to make a home. I think maybe for me, I was the most homesick out of our whole family, um, and I guess I recognized that I, we needed to move home to be around our parents and for kids to be around their grandparents and their nieces and nephews and family's not perfect but it is such an important part of you know our lives um and yeah so we took that move made that move about a year ago uh we live in a little cottage built in the 1800s in the hills of uh, tyrone and uh we have everything we need in jesus we are very content we are very restful and peaceful and and joyful and and I will add and then I'll stop talking. Um, I believe that God gives everybody a little corner of Eden to tend, not just a metaphysical spiritual corner, that's for sure. But I think He gives us a physical place that is ours, and um, that's where we're supposed to tend and steward and maintain, and just in the way that He's called us to. And so, yeah, that's our little corner of Eden. And it mightn't be everybody's idea of a corner of Eden, but it is certainly ours. I love that so much. Oh, that's so cool. So tell me about, I mean, you kind of touched on it. You were feeling a little homesick or a lot homesick, I guess. I don't know. Um, Tell me about where you were. I mean, you've made Nashville your home, but tell me about kind of how you felt on the inside and saying, we need to make this move back to Ireland. Yeah, I guess I was just, um, I was coming off the road. I was touring a lot. And I was coming back to a place that didn't feel like home. I felt like a stranger in the promised land. Mm. And uh, it just was really unsettling. My kids longed for Ireland as well. They also loved America, no doubt about it. But I think it was the idea of being torn between two places. And we had to just settle. We had to decide that we were going to settle our kids somewhere that would be their home for the rest of their childhood and for the rest of our lives, you know, God willing, unless he calls us to something completely random, which he could well do. (laughs) Um, And so we had to choose. You had to make a decision and it was tough. It was hard. We knew we were leaving behind a lot of good friendships and relationships and the home that my wife had really predominantly built for us in uh, Tennessee. But now that we've made that and our kids have stability, yeah, we it, just wisdom is known by our virtue, and we were proven uh, wise in our decision by the results of what we're seeing at home. Our kids have great friendships; they're near family, they're thriving, they live out in the wild, out in the countryside. 
still close to our community of church. We go back to the church that I came to know Jesus in. Uh, so we have long-term friends, long-term relationships, and we're engaged in very ordinary ministry in our church. And it's so rewarding and so, yeah, so beautiful to be a part of. That's awesome. So I remember you saying this before when I heard you talk at Momentum, the radio conference, but initially Heidi, your wife, wasn't totally on board maybe with moving. So how how was that kind of in finding that I don't know, that common ground in that decision and how did she adjust to to moving back? Um, well, I think we had a lot of counseling, Mars counseling for a few years. It was stemming out of, you know, me being gone and the chaos of being a touring musician and problems and stress that puts on a, a relationship and a family. Um, and I guess a, a, a few years before we made that move, I'd settled in my mind that I wasn't going to convince Heidi to do anything. I was just going to leave it with her. Um, much much like she waited for me to, to decide I wanted a fourth child. It took a few <laughs> years before I made that decision. Uh, I decided I would leave it with her and God. And so one day she said we should move home. And we ran with that. And it was great. We were excited. And then the closer we got to the actual move, the more frantic and worried Heidi became about it. And, second guessing and doubting it and you know we when we made a couple of weeks were lovely wonderful and then within a couple of weeks of that all the fear and the doubt and the feelings of isolation and you know came in and as a husband should do i just said heidi hold on it's going to be all right you're going to give it time and time passed and now we have three rabbits a little dog 12 acres of woods and uh we're building an extension onto our home. Our kids are um, settled with friendships in our church. Still working some details out, like schooling and stuff. Um, but no, everyone is thriving and pretty amazing. And you're hearing my house guy play music in the background, so forgive me. <laughs> no, I can't even hear it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I love that. And um, just how that that all played out, the, the peace that has come from <clears throat> that. And um, just hearing about just how God has kind of placed this on your family is really, really cool. So thanks for sharing that. I love that you touched earlier on the ministry at home because from the outside, we all see the ministry of the band and the touring and the new songs. And we yeah. don't get the glimpses into what it's like to do ministry at home or to do ministry in your own church. And so I, I love that. But I also wanted to touch on too, especially with the ministry at home, your parents even got baptized in the past yeah. year? Yeah, well, that's just the faithfulness of God. You know, when I moved out to America, that was one of my biggest fears that I wasn't around to um, to help encourage them towards faith in Jesus. Um, but God in his kindness, while I was out witnessing to everybody else in the world, he was using my little brother, who my wife led to Jesus, to witness to my parents. And so, yeah, we got to baptize him last month in Ireland in our home church that we all attend. So there are three generations of Mulligans attending this little church, whereas before my wife fell in love with Jesus, there was none. And so it's remarkable what God has done. You know, I, I think what's great about our band is we don't take ourselves seriously. We love our audience, the people God has given us, and we try and steward this gift really, really well. But the local church is the hope of the world, not we are messengers. Um, and so we're all connected to our local church. We all serve. We all love our communities. And then when we come out here, uh, we have the overflow of that. Also, as, along with moving home, we cut our touring way, way back. So we condense it into 15 or 16 weeks in a year. Still do the same amount of shows. But it frees up all that time for us all to serve in our communities, to love our wives and kids, to be present dads. Um, and it's changed everything. So when we come out here to play shows, I'm not tense. I'm not stressed. We're just reveling in the joyfulness of God. And it's it's brand new. Our lives are brand new again. And it's amazing. Yeah. I love that. Do you find that it's hard to 
go back on the road after having lived <clears throat> in the peace or kind of like you touched on it and maybe this is the case that having all of that that time to be at home and at peace gives you that like you said the overflow yeah. to be able to go on the road for 15 16 weeks yeah yeah no absolutely like and we separate our touring really well so we'll do three weeks on a week off three weeks in the spring and then in the summer we'll have two or three months off then we'll do the same in the fall and then we'll have two or three months off and we don't take the effort for granted that's you guys the radio that's streaming that's our audience buying tickets and t-shirts that allows us to do that um it, it does come at a cost we've had to lose many opportunities and say no to those things but we've got to say yes to our families um and so when I'm driving down the road, down my little lane, little boring, you can't fit two cars on it, just one car. If you meet a car, you have to drive into the ditch. <laughs> um, as I'm driving down that road, heading for the airport, uh, which is a couple hours away, I actually drive with a lot of excitement. I'm feeling great. Mm. I'm, I'm full. My life has everything I need. Now we are messengers. It's purely the um, washing of other people's feet through our songs. And... For me, it's an extension of how I serve my local church. It's the same thing. Now, we're a rock and roll band. We're not a Sunday morning band. We're not singing vertical worship songs describing Jesus as a garden plant or a stream. We are writing songs for people on the outside, people who feel marginalized, people who wrestle with the monsters in the dead of night. And it's better that I'm a man who's healthy, telling people about a God who can restore and heal, than a man who's unhealthy, trying to hopefully tell people that God can restore and heal. Both are used and we go through seasons, but in this season, I'm really healthy. And therefore our audience is getting the best of me, the best of us. And I couldn't be more thankful. That's awesome. I love that. That's so good. So switching gears are going a little backward. Tell me about the cottage <clears throat> you moved back into. So you have four kids. Yeah. Cottage makes it sound small. Were there things that in moving from <laughs> in moving from Nashville back to Ireland, were there things that you kind of had to let go of or was everything pretty much already in the cottage or how did you navigate that transition? No, no, the cottage is tiny. It's like a thousand square feet. <clears throat> so we moved from this big 3,000 square foot monster of a house in Tennessee <laughs> to this tiny little kitchen where like you cannot swing uh, a cat in our kitchen without hitting cupboards like by the way we're not swinging cats that's not something we do that's a, an analogy but um <laughs> really tiny uh, for the kids they share a room between two each me and Heidi sleep in a loft with no bedroom door um it's really really tight but what's made it beautiful is the outside we can just get outside and roam for thousands of acres um but with the wee extension we're building it makes it into a proper home We'll have an extra bedroom, a kitchen, living room. <clears throat> we'll even get a bedroom with a door. Um, yes. <laughs> but it's beautiful. We get to look out through our window into just like deep forests and glens. And, you know, I'm a really solitudinal kind of man. I like the wild. I like the wild places. And so we live right in the wild, but still only 20 minutes from our local church, 15 minutes from my mom and dad across the mountain. Um, we have everything we need. And honestly, we have everything we need in a thousand square foot too. Yeah. But it is kind of God to let us have something slightly bigger. <laughs> I can imagine. So, uh, goodness, I feel like you just answered all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're grand. That's so, so beautiful. <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I look forward to having that kind of, I don't know, atmosphere to I mean of course I mean okay how about this speak to the person who can't find themselves in the 12 acres at the moment that's not the gift God has for them right now but to the yeah. person who's living in the chaos or in the busy and just hoping God will give them 12 acres someday <laughs> yeah yeah I would say you probably can't have the 12 acres you just can't have your two houses two cars and your 401k you have to sacrifice. You have to move somewhere where people don't really want to live. Nobody wants to live where I live. Um, that's why I'm the only house there with a generator and solar power. Um, so there's always a way 
there's always a way to do it. You can sacrifice, you can have a smaller house like we've had for three or four years, just a tiny little house. Um, and you just have to recognize that there are seasons. Sometimes it's really, really hard. Sometimes it's really brutal. And you have to do what I did, which was just persevere, keep holding on, keep trusting God. And my life wasn't hard because we had a 3,000 square foot house in Middle Tennessee. That's like right. so privileged. Mine was the absence of a deep connection with the land I grew up on, with the people we know, with the community of believers that we were saved into. That's what I longed for. It wasn't bricks and mortar. It wasn't even the 12 acres. It was, it was longing to be with our people, with common values, shared goals, shared dreams, doing simple, ordinary things. That's what I would say to you. If you find yourself deeply unsatisfied, more than often, you've forgotten that it's not the extraordinary things that bring peace, but it's the ordinary living day to day, sharing Jesus one to one, that brings great peace and great joy. If you find yourself dissatisfied, wash feet, serve people, show kindness, um, and you will find peace there. Peace is not found in the stuff. Like, it's just not. Peace is found in doing ordinary things in ordinary ways for an extraordinary God in a community of believers who are trying to do something together. Very imperfectly, very messy, but at least they're trying. Go somewhere you know you belong. Mm. Even if it hurts a bit, even if it's not right, even if it's going to take time. Take the risk. Have some courage. Don't settle for your neighbor's life. Don't settle for your neighbor's experience of Jesus. Don't settle for a secondhand experience of the gospel. Go live it out for yourself with Jesus, with people you love. Life's too short to be having a vicarious experience, getting Jesus from podcasts, from rock and roll singers, from worship leaders, from pastors. But only there is a big mistake. Study the word of God, fall in love with the way of Jesus, and try and live that out where he wants you to live it out and steward it where he wants you to steward it. Yeah. Quit listening to uh, financial gurus. <laughs> Quit trying to plan your life out of existence. Just trust God. Walk mm -hmm. through open doors. Say yes. Say no to the wrong things. Be disciplined. Be obedient. And above all, love God. Love him in ordinary ways. Love him in the dark when no one's watching. Love him in the street when no one knows what you do. Love him generously. But don't let anybody know you're doing it. You know, all this Instagram TikTok nonsense with people demonstrating all of their goodness and all of their virtue signaling can go right back to hell where it came from. Mm -hmm. You know, don't let your left hand know what your right did. And even when your friends or your family judge you for not being kind or generous enough, you will know what you've done in the dead of night and Jesus will know. And that is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Quit trying to defend yourself. Jesus will do that. And quit trying to defend Jesus. He's big and strong enough to do that all by himself. Yeah. And yeah, when you do find somewhere you want to live, keep your car clean. Right? Listen to me. This is really boring advice. I was like, this sounds good. How you steward, well, it does. How you steward the things God gives you will tell you a lot about how you view the responsibility to steward your life in a way God thinks is best suited to you. So I know having four kids is hard. And so a car is always going to be messy, right? Yeah. Try and keep your car clean. Try and keep your windows clean. Try and keep your lawn tended. Try and let the wildflowers grow. Try feed birds. Steward things well. America in particular, and the Western world in general, is just different. There is a deterioration in everything we have. You go to a hotel these days, the cupboards are chipped, the beds are kind of made, there's a stain here, there's a stain there. Everything looks like it's just decaying a little bit. 
Do you know what that shows me? A lack of kindness or general care for the things around us. If you drop a tag, say you buy a new sweater and you drop the tag on the floor in the hotel, don't leave it there. Pick it up and put it in the bin, put it in the trash can. Care for the people who are coming behind you. Care for the things you have, the people you have. Steward it. God's given you a little corner of Eden. And it might seem modest to you. And my wee thing is modest. Trust me, it's modest. But I treat it like it's my Eden. Because I want it to be cared for, intended for. And the people in it to be cared for, intended for. And as a daddy, that's what I'm called to do. To steward my family. To steward our little plot of land. To steward our band. And I wish these were things I had have known. Sounds stupid. I just said clean your car. And a lot of people listen and go, what is he talking about? Uh, it makes sense. <laughs> it does make sense. Mm -hmm. Clean your car because someone's going to get into your car mm -hmm. and you're going to want them to know, I cared enough about you to have this clean so that you could sit in a clean car. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Kind of no, for ish. sure. I mean, I've, I've heard that before, that the way that you tend to even the smallest things in the home say a, say a big deal. And so, no, that makes total sense. Yeah, like that military guy said, if you want to change the world, make your bed. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> make your bed. Clean yeah. your car. Yep. Cut the grass. If you want your grass to grow wild like I do, make sure it's full of wildflowers. Hmm. Make sure the animals are cared for. Yeah. Do you know? Uh, you know, clean my car this I, afternoon. <laughs> You better, because the judgment of the Lord is coming upon you like a fury. <laughs> and just so people do know, we have four kids, so our car gets messy too. Go easy on yourself. Yes, yeah. You know, but if you've got two cars, there's no excuse for one of those cars not to be the good car. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, that's so good. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Wow, that was good. I, I love that. Because um, I think a big part of, I don't know, maybe my desires, and I think a lot of other young women like me too, just not even just young women, but we long for long for the big house and the 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 whole farm and the whole gamut. But um to remember to just be to be grateful for what God has and to steward the things I have right now well, that's a really good thing. Yes. <laughs> right now he says to he you know to he or she who gets little and takes care of it, much will be given. Mm -hmm. It's paraphrasing, but that's the scripture. Yeah. Um, and, and I do want to encourage this. Like, I'm in my 40s. You've got to take your time. Like, eight years ago, I was stone cold broke. I was in government vouchers getting milk and butter down in the government hall in Franklin, Tennessee. you got to take your time. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to learn to be content. I think that's what I wasted in America. This was my biggest mistake. I couldn't. Couldn't find the courage to be content. And it robbed a lot of my wife's contentment, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and graciously, we have found contentment together. So, yeah, I would encourage you, be content where you are. Doesn't mean don't dream or don't hope for. But wash feet. Take care of widows and orphans. The lost and the least. And don't let any bully, anyone bully you into doing it the way they think you should. Like I said, do it in the quiet, in the dead of night, in the secret. Honor God, yeah. always before men and women. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Darren. Yeah. I don't want to take any more of your time today. With the, you got a show going on. So <laughs> thank show. you. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Home and the Maker podcast. And for other podcasts from Shine.fm, visit the Shine.fm podcast channel.